Okay, good afternoon. There's about 40 people online. So welcome to the, the Living with Disability Research Seminar um, for July. My name's Chris Bigby. I'm the Director of the Living with Disability Research Centre um, at La Trobe, and this is our regular monthly seminar. Um, so it's with great pleasure this afternoon that we're going to present to you um, a symposium uh, of three papers that are interconnected um, and we had a bit of a practice of this the other day when we presented it at the international conference of the international association for the scientific study of intellectual and developmental disabilities that was held in amsterdam uh, unfortunately we participated from our offices in melbourne um, but it was a a really good experience to talk to a very broad international audience so we're going to present the three papers that we presented there the other day. So this symposium is about exploring the benefits of using observational methods to assess the quality of staff practice in services for people with intellectual disabilities. And what we're going to do is to describe the rationale for and the process of development of a new simple and reliable observational tool based on the frequently used active support measure. So the new observing staff support tool, which, we, which is still work in progress, though, is designed for use by regulators and managers. Um, so what we're going to do this afternoon is sort of lay out uh, the background knowledge about uh, using observational methods, uh, the research on which uh, the tool is based, and then the process for the development of the tool. So you need to be aware that this is work in progress. It's, it's very well progressed, uh, but it's not, uh, it's not at the actual finish point at the moment. So I'm going to present an overview and then uh, Lincoln, Dr. Lincoln Humphreys is going to present a psychometric evaluation of the active support measure. And Dr. Tala Ariton Bergman is going to talk about the development of the new measure. This is work that has been funded by the National National Disability Insurance Quality and Safeguarding Commission, and Teresa Icono has also been part of this research team. Okay, so. So in terms of uh, background, what we know and should be, should be really obvious to people at the current time is that quality of life for people with disabilities living in supported accommodation is a major research and a major social issue at the moment and research continues to show that there's enormous variability in the quality of life for people who live in group homes between different group homes and this is something that was found in the early deinstitutionalization literature when group homes were first established in the early 1980s in the uk and nothing much has changed since then and ever since then, research and media exposés, inquiries and reports have been showing that there's often very poor quality support in group homes, as well as some very good support, um, and that there is abuse and neglect experienced by people with intellectual disabilities who live in group homes. But the important thing, uh, I think, to emphasise is that there's a great deal of variability between the quality of support and the quality of experiences for people living in group homes. What we also know from a very large body of research from the UK and from, from the research that we've done in Australia is that where you have staff practice based on active support, it's one of the major determinants of the quality of life outcomes for people living in group homes. So if you want to get a good outcome, staff practice based on active support is one of the major variables that you need to pay attention to. And over the time where research has been happening in group homes, structured observation has been the dominant method in order to measure the quality of staff practice and to measure service user outcomes. Just to give you a sense of how far this goes back, um, a review of research that was undertaken by Emerson and Hatton um, in, from between 1980 and 1994 showed that um, 40 studies had used service user engagement and 26 had used service users interactions with staff um, as, as outcome measures using these structured uh, observational tools. 
Um, and we've been running a, a program of research here in Australia about embedding active support since 2009, which originally started in collaboration with Jim Mansell and Julie Beadle Brown. And we've used consistently two observational measures. We've used the engagement in meaningful activity and contact, which we called the EMAC-R, and the active support measure, the ASM. And, and all of our uh, data, all of our papers have reported data from these two measures. But what we also know about these measures uh, and observational measures in general is that they're very resource intensive and they require really a lot of training to use them and a lot of skill. So they really are adapted to, like, they're very expensive. They make research very expensive. And in our case, they've also been critiqued because there's no direct input from the service users. You're using observation, you're not seeking people to give you their, their views and their perspectives. And there's also, uh, these have been criticized because there's insufficient focus on the nature of relationships as well in some of these measures. So, what I'm aiming to do today is to provide then an overview of structured observation as an approach to measuring the quality of service. Why is structured observation used? What measures are used? And have there been new measures developed uh, since that uh, review by Emerson and Hatton? And what I'm doing is I'm building on a very extensive review that was undertaken by Jim Mansell in 2011 um, about structured observation. If anybody's interested, it's a, it's a great uh, research review that's published by the, social, um, the School for Social Care Research in the UK. Um, and I've got the references at the end of the paper. So I'm trying to build on the work that he did up until 2011. So what, what I undertook was a scoping review of the peer reviewed literature between 2012 and 2021 and searched for papers that reported the use of observation as an approach to measuring staff quality, um, papers that reported the development of observational measures about practice in intellectual disability services, and papers that talked about the benefits or, or otherwise of using observation um, as a measure. So what did I find? Well, I actually didn't find what I was expecting to find. Um, there, were, there were very few papers that focused particularly on using observational measures. It, was, it wasn't really the focus of, of any papers at all. Um, and there was very little commentary about the use of these measures. It seemed that very little had been written about this as an approach since the work that Jim had done um, and a couple of book chapters earlier than Jim's review. But what I did identify was um, 25 papers from 2012 plus one PhD study uh, using a whole range of databases and hand searching in various journals. Um, I found 20 papers that reported studies um, about training or the implementation or the experiences of active support in group homes that use observations. Two that you looked at the impact of uh, staff of training for staff about interactions with people in day programs, one about interactions with community group members, and then two studies that sort of at a tangent talked about observations, but talked about the difficulties of relying on paperwork and not using observations. So why is structured observation um, important? Uh, why is this worthwhile undertaking if it's such an expensive and uh, resource intensive uh, type of approach to research. Well, what structured observation does is it actually records what's happening in a service. Um, it's much more objective than other methods, and it's much less reliant on the interpreters, the interpretation of the researcher. But importantly, it also means that you can include people with severe and profound intellectual disability in data collection because as that group of people can't report for themselves about the quality of support. And as Jim Mansell said in his review, for this group of people, no amount of adjustment can enable them to respond to interviews or questionnaires because of the nature and severity of their cognitive disability. And as uh, Herman in her PhD said, observational measures 
include people with severe and profound disabilities and it allows some form of feedback from people who struggle to express their experiences. So the use of structured observation avoids the problems of relying on proxies and in many cases uh, uh, research has used family members as proxies but the problem with family members being proxies for people living in group homes is that they're not there very often and they're not there uh, all the time so they are often sort of out of touch with the sort of day-to-day -day support that people receive and clearly if you rely on staff as a proxy to report about the quality of support uh, they've got a bit of a conflict of interest so they're not particularly good proxies either and uh, using observation also in, avoids the, uh, the social desirability um, or the low expectations that you might experience when you're interviewing people with milder intellectual disabilities about their experiences of support. Um, it also avoids the unreliability of other ways of judging the quality of services or staff support. And there's a couple of very interesting papers which suggests that there's a total lack of consistency between uh, the quality of services judged by regulators or reports from auditors, which have been based on uh, looking at processes and policies in services, and that, that their judgments really don't line up at all with the judgments about the same services made by researchers. And there's a very telling paper by uh, Julie Beadle Brown and her colleagues in 2008, which demonstrates that mismatch between reliance on paperwork from audit reports and reliance on observational data from, from a research study. And the other reason is that uh, relying on paperwork is, is particularly unreliable because the research that Claire Quillam did for her PhD really demonstrates very clearly that paperwork is often constructed by staff based on what they hope might happen. Uh, so they write it before things have happened, or they write it in terms of what they want their manage, what they think they want their managers uh, to hear, uh, or what should have happened, rather than what actually happened. So paperwork really isn't a very reliable source uh, for trying to understand more about the quality. So what's the value of structured observation for research and practice? Um, in Jim Mansell's words, it provides data for improving service quality. He says, quantitative observation has been used to evaluate service quality and to understand what be lies behind variations in quality in terms of the individual characteristics of the people being supported, the kind of services supporting them and the organization of that support as expressed in the pattern and content of staff client interactions. So what structured observation does is it enables you to compare the engagement of people that are being supported or the quality of staff practice between different types of service models. In the early days, it compared those things between institutions and group homes, or it helps you compare engagement and staff practice between different group homes same model but run by maybe different organizations or even between group homes run by the same organization it also enables you to compare the engagement of different groups of people being supported based in terms of their severity and that's been really important because for a long time uh, research has shown that uh, people with intellectual disabilities with more severe disabilities actually receive poorer quality staff support um, than people with milder intellectual disabilities. So being able to compare has been very important. What it does too is it en enables you to identify the relationships between service user engagement and other quality of life outcomes. So you've got outcome measures, practice quality measures, and to compare them with other organisational or staff characteristics. So what this, uh, this method of research has enabled us to do, for instance, is to demonstrate the significance of organisational characteristics like the presence of strong practice leadership and to demonstrate the impact that that has on service user engagement and, their, and people's quality of life outcomes. It's also been very important 
in demonstrating the impact of staff training. So people have used observational measures to demonstrate the changes that happen for service users or in staff practice from training staff. So studies have looked at training staff in active support, uh, training staff in relationship building skills, in using their emotional intelligence, and in positive behaviour support. So you can measure what staff practice was like before training, and then you can look at it again afterwards. And that's much more reliable um, than staff telling you, yes, I've learned a lot from training and this is what I'm doing now. You can use observational methods to actually see them putting training into practice and to see if it's changed their practice. Um, observational methods for practice are also very important in providing feedback to staff. It's a fundamental part of uh, the tasks of practice leadership, observing staff and providing feedback for the purpose of, of improvement. And we would argue too that um, observational methods are really very important in terms of making external judgments about service quality, the type of judgments that auditors, regulators and community visitors um, are expected to make. And in a sense, the community visitor schemes, um, they use observation. It's less structured than it has been in research, but community visitors, a fundamental part of their role has been to go and observe what's happening uh, in services. So it's been very important for those external types of judgments. So I've talked a lot about the value of, of using structured uh, methods, but what are we observing um, and who's, who's doing it and how are we doing it? Um, so the most uh, common way is thinking about whether or not and for how long and how often a person with intellectual disability in a service is engaged in activities or is disengaged, uh, displays communicable acts or uh, particular types of behaviour, has contact with staff, or has contact with other people, uh, maybe members of the public, uh, if you're doing observation in, in a public arena, or other service users, if you're doing it in a, in a group home. And observations also tell you about um, the type of engagement that somebody might be having, what types of activities um, are they engaged with, and what type of contact do they have with staff? Is it is it positive contact? Is it uh, staff uh, talking to people or is it pro staff providing um, assistance to be engaged? And then the next type of, uh, of things that we observe are things like the quality of the interaction or the relationship between a person and a staff member. So how does the person with intellectual disability respond to the staff or how does the staff person respond uh, to the person that they're supporting. So some observational tools measure the quality of those interactions. And most observational tools are done uh, using real-time observations. So researchers use, and this is what we use, momentary time sampling. So you, you take a period of time for two hours and every minute you record what's happening on that minute. And that enables you to tell to, to come up with figures that say, you know, how long has somebody been engaged? What percentage of the time have they been engaged? How much contact did somebody have with staff? There's another method that has been used too, which is uh, used called continuous observation, where you observe for a 10 minute period, what's happening in that 10 minute period, for example. Um, and it's often computer assisted, and that tells, allows you to know how often somebody's behaviour might happen, how long that lasts, and how that might be related to other things that are happening at the same time, uh, which is called in, in the behaviourist jargon, uh, contingency actions. So, you know, using that type of observation, you can pick up that maybe um, staff contact doesn't happen until somebody's been displaying challenging behaviour for five minutes, and then you can see staff responding. So that's the benefit of that type of continuous observation. And then what we've also seen developing as the technologies developed is the analysis of recordings. So um, some of the tools for measuring observation 
now use video recordings and then do analysis sort of after the fact and, and code what, what's recorded rather than doing it in real time. So what I'm going to do now is to just go through uh, some of some of the uh, measures um, that are available so you can get a sense of them um, and there's much more detail than I can talk about today which is available um, you can get these tools you can have a look at them and you can look at the research that has used them but the most common uh, the most common measures are around uh, recording observing activity behavior and staff contact and the most common one now of that has been the EMACR using momentary time sampling but that measure is very similar to another measure called the staff help and resident engagement measure um, which is uh, referenced back to Jones in 1999 um, and these two measures do the same thing more or less they categorize the frequency the type of activity and behavior that the person being supported has and they categorize staff behavior and the contact that staff have with the person being supported. So 15 out of the 20 studies of active support since 2012 have used the EMACR um, and the staff help and resident engagement has used three studies. These measures are sort of um, evolving. So what we've seen is changes over time as the types of categories of activities that people do change too. So uh, in both measures, there's been added in another category, category called non-social activity audiovisual to recognise that uh, people were spending more time, uh, first of all, watching television, uh, watching uh, videos, and now increasingly uh, watching iPads and listening to, um, to smartphones and, and using earphones and those sorts of things. So they're, they're sort of evolving over time to take into account new types of, of, of activities that people do. And the way they work is you, you observe for a particular period of time, you, uh, as you can see, the categories are over there listed, you categorize behavior in terms of engagement, challenging behavior and type of contact. And then you simply tally up the percentage of time uh, that, that you observed each person um, being engaged for during your observation. And these measures have a lot of interrater reliability. So with training, two observers can go to observe for a couple of hours and they'll get the same, the same results because they've been shown to be very reliable. The next uh, most common measure is the quality of support, and that's the active support measure. And that focuses again on the person themselves and on the quality of support that they're receiving. And it's most commonly used in conjunction with the EMACR, again, in 15 of the 20 studies. So this measure has 15 items that are completed after a two hour observation. And they capture the opportunities for involvement um, for the person with a disability and the skills with which staff interact, provide and support those opportunities for engagement for the person with disability. So in shorthand, what this measure is doing is it's measuring the extent and the consistency uh, of people with disabilities receiving active support from staff. There's 15 items and I've listed them on the other side of the slide and each of them are scored from zero to three. And then again, they're tallied up at the end of the period and converted to a percentage. So you get a score. Um, and if you get a score of six, more than 66%, that's classified as the person having received good active support. There's a number of, um, of more recent tools which haven't been used uh, very, very much, but are there in the literature and are probably worthy of further investigation. There's one called the positive interaction checklist, and that measures the changes in the frequency of positive interactions that staff have with the people that they're supporting um, following training in positive interactions. It's got eight items and I've listed them there. And they're drawn, they're sort of a combination of things from the ASM and the EMACAR. Um, and interestingly with this tool, there's an accompanying interview uh, with service users who can participate in an interview, which, has, which sort of aims to line up, do the figures 
match the experience of those interactions that people can report on. And this measure was adapted by Baker at L quite recently and combined with elements of dementia care mapping uh, to measure the style um, and interaction that staff have with the people that they're supporting. This is a measure um, which measures staff support for people's basic needs and it's called the Self-Determination Theory Observation System. It was developed by some people in the Netherlands by Embrantz and, and her colleagues and it aimed to look at the improvement in staff support for people's basic needs again following a training program. And it was adapted from a, a, an observational system that was developed in relation to older people and it's based on self-determination uh, theory. And it has three scales, each have seven gradations, seven points to measure on. And there's a scale called staff respect for autonomy, staff recognition of emotional signals, which is called relatedness, and staff support for competence. Um, and it focuses on the dyad between one person with a disability and the staff member supporting them. And it uses video analysis. You can see the item on the other side. Um, I'll read it out because it's the one about staff respect for autonomy. And it says staff support staff clearly respect and appreciate the ideas and opinions of the client. Moreover, support staff treat the client as an autonomous individual with their own wishes and beliefs. In addition, support staff offer opportunities to the clients to express their own ideas and wishes. That has about three or four concepts in it um, and is incredibly difficult uh, to measure. So it's, it, it's a, a feature of some of these more recent tools is that they have multiple complex uh, concepts within them and they're really difficult to, to measure uh, and to understand and to get reliability. Um, there's two more tools, one which uh, was developed by Hilary Johnson um, and us uh, at the Living with Disability Research Centre, which was called the Positive Engagement and Relationships Momentary Time Sampling, the PAIRS MTS. And what she aimed to do was to change, uh, recognise the change in staff interactions and relationships with the people that they supported following training in a model that Hilary developed as part of her PhD for develop, developing relationships between staff and the people they were supporting. So she identified five relationship processes, recognizing the individual, sharing the moment, connecting, feeling good, and sharing the message. So she observed whether, she, whether staff were demonstrating those behaviors and combined that with the EMACR to get a score about the extent to which they changed their practice to be more relationship focused um, and that was conducted in a day program and then the final uh, measure is really quite interesting it's called the rapport rating scale and it identifies the rapport that the person with the disability has with a staff member through looking at subtle differences in the behavior of the person towards staff so it relies on non-verbal behavior relies on observing the behavior of the person when there's different staff members around to see the extent to which that behavior changes depending on the staff member. And this was based on a PhD study that was undertaken at the Tizard Center, which was based on the original work by Carr about rapport building. And again, it's based on using a video analysis. And this work hasn't been published, but it was piloted with clinicians and the author suggests that this might be really very useful for regulators. If you can observe how people who don't have words, who find it difficult to express themselves, if you can observe their nonverbal behaviour in relation to, diff to different staff being present, then you can get some indications of when things are not quite right. So it could be a very important uh, tool to indicate that that some uh, person might be frightened of staff or might have really poor, poor rapport with them. The final measure is, is a, um, unfortunately, isn't available for review. It's the Short Observational Framework for Inspectors, the SOFI 2, and it was adapted from the uh, dementia care mapping work that was done by the University of Bradford uh, in the early 90s. 
Um, and it aims to measure service user, again, it focuses on service users' mood, on their engagement, and the quality of staff interactions. And it's used by the care inspector in Scotland uh, in older people's homes. And it's an optional tool for the CQC in the UK in relation to care homes for people with intellectual disabilities. But because it was developed for the CQC, it, it hasn't been published. And so it's very hard to sort of review that. But it is based on dementia care mapping. And there's a couple of studies that have looked at dementia care mapping and tried to apply that to services for people with intellectual disability and decided that it's not particularly promising, um, that the codes in dementia care mapping weren't well, uh, didn't fit well into the settings that people with intellectual disabilities lived in compared to those where older people lived. And as Jacob said, it doesn't really reflect the nature of what was actually seen. And again, the coding and the, uh, is really complex for this, for dementia care mapping and requires extensive training. So in conclusion, um, the EMACR and the ASM are the most widely used observational me methods, both here in Australia and, and internationally. And they measure uh, the engagement of person being supported and the staff contact that they receive and the quality of staff support. There's been actually very few new measures, but the new measures that have been developed have tended to focus on staff interactions um, and relationships more than just support. They've all drawn on elements of the, of the ASM, but they often include multiple concepts in a single item and have very complex scoring. They've been piloted with small samples um, and they haven't been uh, well replicated uh, in multiple studies. And some rely on video analysis, which is even more uh, expensive to carry out. Interestingly, um, some of these studies have reported reliability, including the studies of the ASM and the EMACR, but no other psychometric properties have been reported uh, for any of these measures, including the EMACAR and the ASM. We couldn't find any tools that were designed specifically for managers or regulators of intellectual disability services. And anecdotally, what we are beginning to see is that some managers in services in Australia are beginning to use things like the hands-on checklist uh, and to turn that into a scoring checklist uh, to give you numbers and provide feedback to staff. But what they're doing is instead of using the checklist to just provide verbal feedback about the quality of their practice, they're turning that into numbers. And that's a bit problematic because it's really not any form of a, it wasn't developed to be a measure, it was developed as, a, as just simply a checklist for feedback. Um, what we know in Australia too is that the regulators are relying on audits uh, of processes and policies and interviewing people who are able to self-report small groups of people, but leaving out completely the people who can't self-report. And I heard somewhat to my dismay, um, an auditor from a very uh, reputable uh, company um, talking at a conference a little while ago, who claimed that you know, the quality of the audit that they did, the audits they did during lockdown remotely without going on site were similar quality to those that they did when they went on site. Uh, and that gives you some idea of the sort of, the lack of observation uh, that, that happens in audit processes at the moment. So returning to Jim Mansell, and, and I guess we too have argued that observation is key to capturing objective data about the quality of support, for particularly for people who can't self-report and thus to improving the quality of practice. But he also said what we need to do is attend to the definitions and the codes, making sure that these address the questions of interest and ensuring that they're properly developed and tested to be valid and reliable. And I think as I've explained, this hasn't really been done very well. We haven't got a lot of data about the validity and the other psychometric properties of the measures that we've been using. But I think our argument too is that we also need to develop some simpler measures for non-researchers, 
for managers and for auditors and maybe for community visitors too, so that they've got a more formal way of, of measuring and using observation to measure the quality of staff support. Um, so my presentation extends on Chris's by focusing on one particular observational measure of the quality of staff support, and that's the ASM or the active support measure. So I'll just give a little bit of a background about the ASM because Chris covered much of this. So the ASM is the most frequently used observational measure of the quality of staff support for people with intellectual disabilities living in supported accommodation services. Um, so studies, much of the research that's been conducted using the ASM has been conducted has been in the UK. Um, so at the Tizard Centre, Jim Mansell and colleagues, um, Julie Beagle Brown. So they were the two people who were who developed the ASM, and they've done much of the research in the UK using it. And then, uh, so they've been using it for about the last twenty years. And then here at Latrobe, uh, we've been using it for about 10 years through collaboration with Jim Mansell and Julie Beetle Brown. So much of the research that has been published with uh, the ASM has been conducted uh, in the UK and in Australia. And what the findings from this research has shown um, is that the ASM is associated with service users' levels of engagement. So uh, the studies have been shown using correlation, multiple regression and multi-level modelling that the ASM is a good predictor of service users' level of engagement. So what that means is, is that when staff provide good quality support as measured on the ASM, that people experience higher levels of engagement in meaningful activities and relationships. But despite the frequent use of the ASM, um, you know, it's been used for more than 20 years, there hasn't been an in-depth or fully psychometric testing of the ASM. Um, or at least there hasn't been a published version of the psychometric testings. Usually when um, researchers use the ASM in, in research and publish about it, all they report is the Cronbach's alpha, which is a, uh, a measure of internal consistency or internal reliability of the ASM. Um, so given that there was this gap in the research, um, our aim was to address the question of what are the psychometric properties of the active support measure? So I just want to give a bit more of information about the, the ASM. Um, much of this was touched on already by Chris. So to complete the ASM, researchers, um, they will, it will, in the studies that we've used in the Tizard Centre, they will do two hour observations, non-participant observations. So um, not participating with the people that are being observed and complete the EMAC-R. And then after the two hour observation, they will complete the ASM. So the ASM is a measure of the quality of staff support that the person with intellectual disability receives. It consists of 15 items. So some example items are choice of activities, um, grade assistance to ensure success, and interpersonal warmth. Um, so to rate these items, it uses a four point scale, um, zero being the lowest level or the lowest score. This usually means that um, either the staff or the person received from staff poor or inconsistent support, or that the support was not provided or not observed. So what that means is, uh, if you look up there, there's the item about grade assistance to ensure success. If the staff didn't provide any grade assistance during the observation, then they would score a zero uh, for that particular item. Um, the zero has sort of a inconsistent interpretation with the ASM, it's sort of, um, you know, for most items, it does mean the support was not provided or not observed, but for some, it means the poor or inconsistent support. So uh, the item which is about teamwork, staff working as a team, um, a zero means that the staff did not work as a team. So a zero it has a different meaning um, across some of the items of the ASM. But a three, which is the high score, has a consistent meaning across all the items. So that means a good, good or cons consistent support. Um, one of the other issues with the rating of the ASM, I just want to sort of mention now, is that when for some items that are not observed, they're not rated at all. So there's an item about differential reinforcement of other behaviour, which uh, is probably not easy to interpret by that statement, but it has to do with maladaptive behaviour or people demonstrating problem behaviour. So if the person uh, that's being observed, the resident of the group home, for instance, 
uh, doesn't display any problem behavior, then that particular item isn't rated at all. And then it presents as missing item, uh, missing data in the data set. So it presents a little bit of an issue when it comes to scoring. And as you'll see with this, um, with the result, uh, the reporting of the findings of this study, it presented a bit of a problem with the further analysis. Okay, so to test the psychometric properties of the ASM, what we conducted was a secondary analysis of data previously collected using the ASM. Um, so the ASM has been used uh, with research here at La Trobe for the past 10 years, um, you know, from 2009 um, is when it started. So we used uh, a subset from the long longitudinal study into embedding active support and practice leadership uh, in Australian accommodation services. So this was, after 10 years of data collection, this was a very large data set. Um, so after a bit of cleaning of the data set, we got it down to 1,713 participants. And then to conduct the analyses for this uh, particular study, we had to make sure that the people that were in the data set were independent. That means that they weren't in there twice or more, so only in there once. So we had to pick a, a random sample if they appeared in the longitudinal study you know, over consecutive years. So it was um, uh, independent. And then that brought the data set down into 884. But that's still more than sufficient for the psychometric testing aims of this study. Um, and then the average adaptive behavior of the participants was um, 148. So that just means that on average, um, participants were, had more severe intellectual disabilities, but it also, the standard deviation there, there was a spread. So uh, there were people with mild, moderate um, uh, participants uh, we had data for in this study. All right, so we conducted three statistical analyses to um, to, uh, to test the psychometric properties of the ASM. Um, the first is that we used exploratory factor analysis. So we use this to determine the underlying factor structure of the ASM. So this is a very stats heavy um, presentation. So I'll explain in a second what all this means for anyone that doesn't have a in-depth statistical knowledge or hasn't um, come across this before. Uh, the other is Cronbach's alpha, which is to test internal consistency. And the third thing was rash analysis. And this is to sort of extend on the exploratory factor analysis to test the dimensionality of the ASM and its items. So that's quite a mouthful there. It's essentially, what we're, all we're trying to do is ask the questions of, um, you know, does the ASM, the active support measure, just measure one dimension of the quality of staff support or two dimensions of the quality of staff support? This hasn't been um, asked or addressed in prior research. And then more generally, all we're doing with these three analyses is asking, how do the 15 items of the ASM hang together? What do they tell us when we um, get this data and what does it tell us about the quality of staff support? And then to further test things like, you know, how reliable and how, um, how valid is the ASM <clears throat> and the quality of the data it presents. All right, so here are the results. So for the factor analysis, we found that of the 15 items, that 10 of them loaded onto two factors. So what that means is that uh, 10 items were found to have good properties and that we found that there were two dimensions of the quality of staff support. I'll, on the next slide, I'll explain what they are and um, what the two factors were. Um, they accounted for 66% of the variance. So that's really good for uh, a study of uh, this nature in the social sciences. Um, the Kronbach's alpha, you know, they were both uh, the first factor was 0.94, so that's really good, and 0.78 is acceptable for the consistency. And then the rash analysis, uh, we found that, again, that 10 items were retained. Um, it also, like the factor analysis, indicated that there was a multi-dimensional structure. So what that means is that there's two or more dimensions of the quality of staff support. And the rash analysis told us a bit more about um, how well each of the individual items perform. So we know which ones perform well and which ones, um, you know, explain less of the variance and things like that. But I guess for this slide, the main thing to take away is that um, we found that there were two dimensions of support and between the factor analysis and the rash analysis is that for nine of the 10 items, um, we got similar results in that they're the ones that are retained um, uh, in the final active support measure. Okay, so here are the results of the two-factor analysis. 
So the first factor we found, um, it comprised seven items. So that's the one on the left there. So as you can see, some of these items were the choice of activities, task appropriately analyzed, um, that the person was presented with real activities. Um, so taken together, the sort of theme that we um, sort of got about these items and what they were measuring is that they were about supporting engagement in activities. So what this means is it's about the person and the support they were receiving from staff, that that type of support was about uh, assisting or enabling people to engage in activities. Um, and then the other factor had items like interpersonal warmth, um, that the staff member's speech matches the development level of the client. So we end up naming this factor interacting with the person. So this, these items took on a bit more of a social interaction or relationship um, sort of uh, approach as opposed to being about the engagement. Um, so as you can see there that the loadings for the items for, uh, on both scales are pretty high. Um, you know, most are above 0.6. There's sort of the lowest one there about teaching, you know, is 0.47. So there's sort of perhaps a little bit of an argument about whether to remove that to improve the properties of the ASM or not. Um, so I just want to talk a bit about the items that were not retained in the final analysis. So these were the five items that were removed based on our testing, doing the factor analysis and the rash analysis. Um, so one particular item was not retained, uh, differential reinforcement of other behaviours. So this is the item that I spoke about uh, earlier, about when it goes, uh, when this particular item is not observed, that it sort of enters, it's not rated and therefore it becomes uh, missing data. So for this particular item, we had uh, missing data or not applicable or not observed for 86% of the participants in the data set. So this became a problem because uh, when we ran the analyses, it just wouldn't, uh, you know, it was creating a lot of problems. So it sort of dropped out very early in the analysis. Um, with some other items, we had issues with skewness. Um, so one item is that staff manage serious challenging behavior well. So for 89% of the participants in the data set, they were getting well, they received a rating of zero. So what that meant was that for most of the observations, we weren't seeing uh, residents displaying challenging behavior. So there was no need for staff to provide any support uh, in relation to this. And same with written programs in routine use. So we didn't see, um, you know, for 92% of the observations, we didn't see staff using some form of written program or uh, while they're providing any support. So these two items were again, very problematic uh, in the analyses. So they sort of dropped out um, from being retained. And then we had some issues with some other items, um, you know, just not performing well in the factor analysis. So these were staff work as a team um, and sufficient staff contact. So they, these are the five items that sort of dropped out from the original active support measure. And the removal of these items was um, supported by the rash analysis. Okay, so what does uh, this research tell us about the ASM? It tells us that there are 10 items which, um, well, they're, they're the better items, the ones that are uh, uh, explaining more of the variance, or these are the items um, that are more consistent across observations, and they're the ones that should be, you know, that were retained following our analysis, and that these items measure two dimensions of the quality of, of staff support. So the first dimension uh, was supporting engagement activities and the other was about interacting with the person um, and the quality of that interaction, you know, how warm it was and the type of speech. Um, what this analysis has told us is that the ASM has good psychometric properties. So, you know, as Chris mentioned in her presentation, the ASM of all the observational measures has been used and tested quite a lot. Um, and what this, um, sort of analysis or study into the psychometric problem properties is that, you know, it sort of reinforces it that it has good psychometric properties. Um, you know, the factor analysis told us that, the uh, Cronbach's alpha and the rationales, but also, as I said at the beginning, uh, you know, it has pretty good predictive validity as well, that there's been quite a lot of research over the years that does consistently find that it is associ associated with uh, levels of engagement in meaningful activities. Um, so now that we've 
revised the ASM and it's been reduced down to 10 items rather than the original 15. It has some potential benefits uh, in future research. So um, it might be easier in research because it's shorter. You know, having to look at only 10 items compared to 15 will be easier for researchers to conduct their observations. They don't have to look for uh, as many aspects of support. Um, it has meant that some of the items which were more difficult to rate um, during observations have been removed. Um, and finally, this revised ASM, um, you know, it could perform the basis of the development of an observational tool for non-researchers because it's shown uh, the validity and reliability of the ASM, which segues into Tal's presentation. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Lincoln, for a great segue. I just want to make sure that you're seeing my slides. Chris? Yeah, okay. So I'm just going to build on what actually Chris and Lincoln already presented, that um, structured observation is a key of capturing objective data about quality of staff support. And staff support, the quality of staff support is important because it's very, very heavily linked to the quality of services and the quality of outcomes that people with intellectual disability um, have in services, so the quality of life and satisfaction. The problem is that currently there, we couldn't find, there is no validated tools designed for non-researchers, managers, regulators, um, auditors of, of services. Um, for instance, the active support uh, measure, the ASM, has been used successfully for many years by researchers uh, to conduct observation to support, but it's complex and requires extensive training and it's very complicated. Um, it took me a couple of months to get my head around it and I'm sure that it's intensive training and it's it's really good measure, but it is really um, designed for researchers. Uh, not for auditors or managers. So our aim is to develop and to validate the new simple observational tools to evaluate the quality of staff support. It's based on these um, conceptual framework of the ASM, which again, Lincoln have just she, um, show how valid it is. And it is um, designed specifically to be administered by non-researchers. So frontline supervisor, managers of services, um, regulators. Um, again, the aim of it is to evaluate the quality of key aspects of support. So in order to develop and to validate the uh, observe the OZ, the, OZ, the new tool um, for non-researchers, we went through a couple of steps. First of all, um, as Lincoln has um, presented, we did a secondary analysis of longitudinal study and data that we had about the ASM. So we did the ASM factor analysis, the RASH analysis, and, what, and another level that we did is we went through millions of notes and field notes and comments about observation that people done using the ASM. And we tried to capture um, the knowledge that is um, behind the numbers. So what examples for good and bad um, items and what they did and did not captured. We try to understand in depth what, what did the numbers meant. Um, as Lincoln um, presented, the secondary analysis of this huge data set, which is a pleasure to work with is such a big and profound data set. Um, identify key aspects of quality of staff support um, that are the basis for the new observational tool. And they are on two uh, dimensions of staff support. Again, as Lincoln has presented, uh, supporting the engagement in activities and interacting with the person. The new items that we generated um, were generated to tap these dimensions and the aspects and try to put it in simple words with simple examples so it will be very straightforward to use. So at the end of this we were left with a list of 10 items 
um, in two dimensions and a lot of good and bad examples of, again, what, what is capturing. Then the research team, the team sat together and tried to capture these and write, and write um, items. This was the first time that we actually tried to generate um, the items that are in the OZ and the instructions. We had um, the first initial tools, and then we went to evaluate the items for uh, relevance, the clarity, and face validity um, by, um, by expert. Uh, so the tool was uh, reviewed by expert. Experts were uh, defined as people who were research, who had research experience with the ASM or had in-depth knowledge of quality of support. Um, firstly, we just sent them the, um, the tool and the instructions and asked them to tell us what they think. So what each item is tapping um, and how, to what extent, to what extent, to a rating, to what extent in which each item and key aspects are support. Then, um, we also asked the experts to write some comments about the items, uh, what do they think um, and how about them, is, are they clear and, and provide some suggestion to improve the item. And um, lastly, what we did is we sent the experts um, um, videos of observations and we asked them to use the new tool um, to use that. And after that, we interviewed them and asked them, um, what did they rate? What did they think? Um, what were the comments? Based on those, this feedback, we developed and we refined the uh, items and we had the version, the, the number two version of the tool and the instructions. Then um, the next step would be, um, and this is where we are right now, is pre-testing and, uh, and the evaluation of the um, OL at, of the of the new tool. So in this time, initially the researchers test the tool by conducting observation and um, completing the tool in services. In the next step, it will be researchers and frontline uh, supervisors and managers in supported accommodation services will um, at the same time conduct an observation using the new tool. And then we will compare the um, comparison will be made between the researchers and frontline supervisors managers scores. After the observation, um, we will interview the frontline supervisors and managers and ask them questions about uh, the new tools. For, in for instance, how did they interpret the items um, the reasoning for providing a certain score, what aspect of the support um, they tapped and why did they uh, use, you know, scored the item in nine or two or two or three. Um, in addition, the, um, the researchers uh, will also complete the ASM and to establish the concurrent validity of the new tool. Um, then we will compare the scores from the ASM and the new tool with the frontline supervisor manager scores. Uh, the new observation tool will be, will be revised and refined based on the information collected from uh, those, those observations and interviews. And we will continue to do this process until we, um, until the face validity and concurrent validity is acceptable. Um, Right now we are there, um, and thanks to COVID, it's quite hard to do now observation and to send people to do observation in services, but hopefully um, after the sixth wave will be over, so we'll be able to uh, continue with this um, stage. Once we have the final um, OZ tool and the instructions, then we will uh, develop training and materials again, focused to non-researchers, so supervisors, regulators, um, how to use the tools, um, how to conduct observation, 
and how to assess the quality of active support. And the final stage will be to develop the OZ um, app, which is going to hopefully run on um, people's phone or um, uh, laptops, and then they would be able to come and to use um, this tool as easily and record it using the app. So what we have right now, we are right now with version two or three of the tool. Um, it is not finalized yet, but um, what the focus of the observation tool will be one staff member provides support to one person. It is based on observation of two to 20, to 20 to 60 minutes that again we are looking at one diet we're looking at one person and one staff member and trying to capture the quality of support provided um, it consists eight items main items and two additional items we will go through them um, in a minute and each item is scored on a three point scale three is a high quality of support uh, in most of the old instances, staff provided the support. And one is um, a low level of support. In most of all instances, staff did not provide the support. And in between, we have two, which is staff, staff sometimes provided and sometimes did not provide the support. And what we'll do in the next couple of minutes is we'll go item by items and try to understand what they are capturing. So. As you, you might remember, we are looking at two different dimensions. The first one is how staff are um, supporting the engagement in the activities. And this has five items. The first one is offering real activity to be engaged in. Um, this item captures the extent that staff member offer the person meaningful activities that have real purpose in different um, sphere so it could be leisure recreation social household whatever but it it should be something that it has a real purpose so setting the table or folding laundry or whatever it could be um, that has real purpose and the, and and the activity is meaningful it's not the activity just for the sake of the activity um, in some observation and notes that we've seen we had uh, for instance people for example putting um, things in and out of boxes with no real purpose or um, meaning, just to keep the person engaged. So that would be, for instance, something that would score on a one. So the scoring will be most of all of the activities the staff member offered to the person had um, real purpose. That would be a high score, that would be a three. Some of the activities the staff members offered to the person had real purpose, that would be a two. And most of all of the activities the staff members offered to the person did not have real purpose, that would be a low score of one. Um, the second um, item in this, in the support, um, in staff supporting engaging in the activity would be um, offering choice of activities. And this tap, the, the extent the staff member provides the person with opportunities to make choices. And again, this goes beyond just, would you like to drink coffee or tea? It includes choices of the activity, how long, uh, how to do them, and whether the person chooses to participate or not to participate, when and for how long. Um, if they want to do a break, is this respectful, is respected um, by the staff member? Um, high score here with, in most of all instances, the staff member provide the person with opportunities to make choices. So it's not, would you like to do this or this? It's more about how are we going to do it um, if the person is actually um, portraying that they don't want to do it now, is this respected? So it, it's, it's more than um, just you know, the, the dichotomy of whether you want to do this or this. Providing opportunity, the third one is providing opportunity to engage the person. Stuff, um, again, it's about breaking complex activities into simpler part to provide opportunities for the person to be engaging. Even if it's a complex task, um, 
if the staff is um, skilled, they can break it down to little parts that the, st that the person will be able to participate in. Um, and what we're looking at is into what extent the staff member provided opportunity for the person to engage in all or parts of the activities. A high score here will be the staff member provided the person with many opportunities to be involved in the activities or part of them. Um, the fourth item will be providing the right type and amount of assistance. Not too much, not too little. Um, it's about the right type and amount of assistance for the person to engage in the activity. So how much the support is actually tailored to the person. High score will be, in most or all instances, the staff member provided the right type and amount of assistance to the person to engage in the activity. The last um, item here will be um, ensuring that the message is clear to the person about what is being offered. The extent in which the staff member clearly communicate verbally and non-verbally to the person what is being offered to them or what um, and what they are being asked to do. High score will be here in most or all incidents the staff member communicate um, what is being offered or expected in a way that was tailored to the person. The next three items are about the second dimension with that, which is about interacting with the person. Um, the first one is uh, noticing and responding to the person communication. The extent um, that the staff member notice and respond to the person communication verbally and non-verbally. And again, this um, tool is designed um, to capture the quality of support for, for, all, for people with, again, that are verbal and non-verbal, be people that communicate in different ways. And it's really important to see how um, staff are noticing and responding to people trying to communicate with them and getting their attention. Um, high score will be the staff member noticed and responded to all or most attempts made by the person to communicate. Um, respecting the person in all interaction. We had a lot of discussions about that. Um, because we can interpret respect in different ways. And um, what we want to see in this item is the quality of the relationship and the interaction between the staff member and the person. And the extent that the staff member shows respect to the person and acknowledge their personhood. They acknowledge that they're there, they acknowledge that there's something beyond the task and they acknowledge the person that they're communicating with. So in most of the high score here will be in most of all instances, the staff member paid attention and showed interest in, the, in what the person um, experienced in the moment. Again, it's acknowledging that the person is there and what they are experiencing. The final one is having a friendly interaction. So this again goes beyond the way that the person, the, the task, the staff and the person are interacting around the different um, activities. It's more about how um, the staff and the person are communicating and whether the staff member uh, contribute to friendly atmosphere and take opportunities to include the person in social interactions. Um, it may include sharing of moment of fun as uh, Hillary Johnson's um, tool shows with the person, um, bringing the person into the conversation with others, um, making positive comments about what the person is doing or experiencing, um, sharing humor, um, verbal or non-verbal um, meaning, um, just um, having gesture, just having a friendly interaction that goes beyond just the very um, task-oriented interaction with the person. High score will be the staff member interaction with the person created a friendly atmosphere. In addition, um, we thought again, based on the um, ASM factor analysis, We've seen that in many cases, there are two very strong, um, there in, 
there are very strong key aspects that we need to capture, but in 80 something percent of the time, we don't see them. So that means that like teaching and challenging behavior, but we thought it is still important to include them in this measure. So um, the two additional items are um, items that are being scored only if you'd see um, that there was an opportunity to, for teaching the person something new, or when um, you have observed um, challenging behavior, the person uh, being supported exhibit behavior that um, uh, caused immediate harm and danger to themselves or others or property. So teaching something new is again, we ask the person first, did you see an opportunity to teach something new? new? Yes or no? And then we, if the, the um, observer have ticked yes, then the item is about the extent of the staff member use the available opportunity to teach the person something new. High score will be here, the staff member used it, um, or took most of all the available opportunity to teach the person something new. Um, a beautiful example was here in one of the observation um, when um, staff and um, was support, supporting the person to set the table and they just took the opportunity to show them how to uh, fold napkin in a fancy way. And again, it's just those little something and that would be a high score for instance. Um, another one is responding well to behavior that um, is a danger to self or others. And again, it's here it's about um, the staff or be, if this uh, behavior has been observed, we look at the staff member's um, reaction. We, uh, the staff member is confident, the staff member knows, knows what they're doing, and it could be um, calling for another staff member help. It could be and handling it together, but the staff member is not, is confident with what they're doing. They respond to the situation. Um, they respond to what the person is experiencing, they ensure that the person and any other people present are safe, um, and they respond to the person's behavior, their emotion, their feeling, and the situation. Again, it's about knowing what they're doing. Um, next steps, again, as we said, we have to finalize the um, new tool deals uh, validation to develop training materials about how to use the OS, the OS tool and to develop the app. So just to conclude and to think about why we are doing all of this, again, this is a tool that is for non-researchers. It is um, important to capture the quality of staff support because it is linked to positive outcome, quality of life of people with intellectual disability and to the job satisfaction of support workers. Um, by using the OZ, we hope, which is simple, um, the frontline supervisors um, can provide better feedback and and coaching to support workers. They can provide um, meaningful feedback with examples of what they have observed. Um, ensuring the support workers um, are skills in quality of support, in providing quality of support. Um, enhancing betting monitoring of quality of services by regulators, um, bodies, again, using observations and not looking at the interaction looking at the support provided and not just uh, the paperwork. Um, enhancing the development of benchmarks and standards for quality of active support or for support that could be implemented across all services. Again, it provides a, a robust um, data of what is quality of support and what does it look like and how to measure it. And enhancing, again, Let's not forget at the end of the day, it's enhancing the quality of support that people with intellectual disability can experience. And then um, the research has shown the link between the quality of the support and the better quality of life outcomes that people um, can experience. Um, thank you.